Seigneur, nous bénissons ton nom ce matin. Tu es le Dieu qui a permis que nous puissions nous retrouver en ce lieu. Seigneur, nous bénissons toute ton Église. Nous prions que le Saint-Esprit puisse nous guider. Seigneur, nous prions que tu puisses nous montrer le chemin à suivre. Nous prions pour la prédication de ce matin, Seigneur. Bénis ton Église. Bénis tout et chacun, oh Dieu. Bénis les pasteurs. Laisse que cette parole qui va sortir ce matin produise des fruits dans nos cœurs. Nous prions au nom de Jésus. Nous disons Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, Prosper. Thank you. That is so refreshing to me because that reminds me of being in Africa and hearing our students and hearing in our churches Everything was in French. And so they would come and they would pray. And just to hear them speak to God in their language. What a, what a neat thing that is. Well, again, I'm glad to see all of you here today. We're going to go back to Genesis this morning. But let me start with, with just a story. Chuck Swindoll. Most of you have heard of Chuck Swindoll. Many of you listen to Chuck Swindoll. He made the point in one of his messages that a person's name is really significant, really significant. And in making this point, he tells a very humorous story about one of the ushers in his former church in California. Now, the man's name was Harold Butts, and it was his job to seat people when they came into the church. And Harold was very particular and sensitive about his name often telling people not to ever call him Harry. But no one figured out why. But on one particular Sunday, everyone found out why. You see, on this particular Sunday, the church was absolutely packed. And Harold was having a hard time locating two seats for a couple. Swindoll, who was about to lead the congregation in prayer, noticed Harold looking frantically over the crowd for two empty seats. All of a sudden, Swindoll sees two seats on the fifth row, and forgetting all about Harold's demand, never to call him Harry, said, Will the couple with Harry Butts please come down to the fifth row? As Chuck said later, he never called Harold Harry again. Names matter. Names have significance, especially God's names. And God has many names. But of all the names that God has, there is one name that is his name forever. There is one name which is his name Par excellence. It is the name that he has chosen for himself. And this morning, we are going to see God introduce himself by this name in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And this is really a name that we should get to know and get to know well. So go with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. We're just going to be really focusing on this verse this morning. In Genesis chapter 1, we've had the account of the creation. Then we move to Genesis chapter 2 and we saw God's day of rest, Adam and Eve's first day, really, full day, in this brand new world that God has created. And then the story begins to change a little bit. There is a, a new movement in Genesis that begins in Genesis 2 verse 4. Here's what it says. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now, if you were to look in a Hebrew Bible, and some of you have this in your English Bibles, it would say something like this. This is the account or this is the record of the generations of heaven and earth. Very important word. In other words, Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the heaven and earth. And here in Genesis 2, verse 4, a major movement, a major change of direction is going to take place. We're no longer going to talk about creation simply from the standpoint of God creating. We're going to begin talking about everything 
in relation to who is going to be living on this earth that he has created. So now we're going to be talking about the generations of people that God is going to fill the earth with, beginning with Adam and Eve. So this is the story now about the people who are going to live on the earth. Now, this phrase, these are the generations, or the record of the generations, is going to be used nine more times in the book of Genesis, basically dividing the book of Genesis into ten major sections, all talking about the people, and specifically about two kinds of people that are going to be living on the earth. From the time of Genesis 2-4 all the way until the end of time on earth. Two kinds of people. Just two categories of people. You see, as far as God and Genesis are concerned, people are not so much divided by their race, by their skin color by their language, their nationality, their culture, or where they live. Rather, the dividing line between all people who have ever lived on earth is, do they know God or do they not know God? Do they have a relationship with God or do they not have a relationship with God? Do they worship God or do they not worship God? Do they walk with God or do they not walk with God? That is going to be the dividing line. And so from Genesis 2-4, we begin to see the story evolve of the generations of people on the face of the earth and it's very quickly going to divide into two groups and two groups only those who are in a covenant relationship with God and those who are not in a covenant relationship with God. Those who are in a relationship in which God has redeemed them from their sins and saved them and forgiven them and those who have not been redeemed from their sins. God says there's just really two kinds of people. And the rest of the Bible is going to begin to show us the stories of those two kinds of people. Now, there's something else that we need to see in Genesis 2-4 which is really important. And it is that God gives us a new name for himself in Genesis 2, verse 4. All through Genesis 1, 35 times in all, God refers to himself as Elohim, the all-powerful, infinite creator God. It's really more of a title than it is a name. But that is how he is referred to 35 times in Genesis chapter 1. But here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, God is referred to for the first time in the Bible as Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh Elohim. We get the name Jehovah from Yahweh. But it's Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim, or or just the name Yahweh itself, is the primary name used of God for the rest of chapter 2 all the way through the end of chapter 4 where it is used 29 times. However, it is not used in the section in chapter 3 when the serpent and Eve are talking about God as Satan is deceiving and tempting her to sin. And, And that's interesting because as Satan is using the serpent to tempt Eve to sin... And they are conversing back and forth, discussing the pros and the cons of disobedience to God. What did God say? What did God not say? They do not use Yahweh because Yahweh is God's personal name. Rather, they use the title Elohim. And the reason why they don't consciously use God's name Yahweh, His personal name, The name that he's chosen for himself 
to identify himself and to describe himself, and we'll talk more about that as we go on, the reason they don't use that name when they're talking about disobeying God is because it is much easier to sin against God when He is not personal to you. It is much easier to sin against God when He is not real to you. When you can forget about Him as a real, living person that you are accountable to. In fact, it's very difficult to sin against people that we really see before our eyes as real, personal people, isn't it? That we are in a relationship with. And in fact, in order to sin against people like that, we have to almost depersonalize them. We have to almost forget about who they are so that we can pursue our own happiness in our own sin, even when it is against somebody that we say we love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book on temptation when discussing how Satan depersonalizes God to us when he tempts us to sin. Listen to what he says. I think he hit it right on the head. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. It makes no difference whether it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money. Joy in God is extinguished in us, and we seek all of our joy in the creature. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality, and only desire for the creature is real. Satan does not here fill us with hatred for God, but with forgetfulness of God. You see, when we are tempted to sin... If God is not real to us, if He is not personal to us, if He is not front and center to us, Satan doesn't have to fill us with hatred for Him. He just has to fill us with forgetfulness of Him. And we begin to move in the direction that we really should not go. And so that's why Satan does not use God's personal name in this whole section. It's very obvious. If you could read this in Hebrew, you would see it's obvious. It's all Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim in chapter 2. It's after the temptation in chapter 4. It's El Yahweh Elohim. But in chapter 3, during the temptation, it is just the title Elohim. God is being depersonalized by Satan in order to make it easier to forget who he is. So Yahweh was the name that Adam and Eve knew Elohim as. Because they're created at the end of Genesis chapter 1. They enter into this paradise here in chapter 2. Their first full day on the earth is God's day of rest. And God is introduced here as Yahweh Elohim. This is the name that they would have known Him as. And in this period of God's rest, this is the name that they would have related to him as. And there's something very significant about that because there's something very significant about this name. Now, God gave himself the name Yahweh. No man gave him this name. This is God's chosen personal name. Now, now some of you were given a name. And maybe you didn't like your name. And so later on in life, you chose another name. A name that you like and that you identify with and that you chose to be your name. And that's a name that's special to you, maybe. Well, God chose a name. And He loves to be known by this name, which is probably why it is used 6,828 times in the Bible. Compared to Elohim, which is used 2,500 times. Yahweh is the name that is used of God far more than any other name. And you can recognize Yahweh in your Bibles when you see the word LORD all in caps, all in capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that, that is Yahweh. That is Jehovah. 
Sometimes the name Yahweh shows up in its shortened form, Yah, embedded in words like Hallelujah. Yah is Yahweh. Hallelujah, praise, praise Yahweh. So Hallelujah means praise Yahweh. It's right there. God announced his name to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. And when he did, God said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And what we see in Scripture in both the Old and New Testaments is that in this name, Yahweh, God packs the weightiest truths about himself. First of all, the name Yahweh has the primary meaning of God's self-existence, which simply means that it is God's nature to not only exist, but to have always existed, and that it would be utterly impossible for God not to exist. And this is why God says in Exodus 3 that Yahweh means I am that I am. Self-existence. I have always existed. I will always exist. It is my nature to exist. I am infinite. And that's the second concept behind Yahweh, God's infinity, which means that God is not and cannot be bound. He cannot be limited. He cannot be completely known. You know, there's probably a good reason why heaven is eternal. You know, you don't get in heaven and, and, and you know everything there is to know. What you do know is going to be correct. But heaven is going to be a process of continuing to grow in our understanding and in our knowledge of God for the simple reason that God is infinite. You cannot come to the end of an infinite being. So that means that every day we will be learning more and more about this great God, which means that every day is going to get better and better. Just the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics, that here on earth, because of sin, everything just keeps winding down worse and worse and worse. Heaven is the opposite of that because there's no sin. God cannot be completely comprehensively understood or explained or even defined by anyone or anything that exists. Not completely, not comprehensively. It also means that God's attributes, such as His mercy and His love and His kindness and His forgiveness and His grace, are infinite toward those He chooses to love in a redeeming and saving way. That's why David, a man who should know, says in Psalms 108, verse 4, that God's loving kindness is above the heavens. The idea, it just keeps going and going and going. He wrote in Psalm 103, verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's loving kindness toward those who fear Him. What David was trying to get across to people is that God's mercy, His forgiveness, and His love toward His people are infinite, which means you cannot out-sin the grace of God. Now, Now, there are some believers that say, don't say that. How do we keep them contained if you say that? Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a great preacher of the last century, said this, that if a man preaches grace and preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ, if no one in the room misunderstands what he's saying, he's not teaching grace. If there are not going to be people who are going to say, if you teach grace, people are going to just go out and send their eyes out. You're probably not teaching grace. So, I'm not saying... That God is saying that we just go ahead and go out and just sin, sin, sin because God is gracious. What I'm saying is, is that you as a human being cannot out-sin the infinite grace of God. In fact, Paul tells us that in Romans 5.20 when he says where sin abounds, God's grace what? Super abounds. That's part of the name Yahweh. There's a third thing about Yahweh. It's the name for God which requires, get this, it requires God to have a relationship. 
You can't have this name without a relationship. It requires a relationship to be known as Yahweh and a relationship with a different kind of being, a lesser being, because apart from another lesser being, the name would make no sense. You see, just as the title Elohim, which designates God as the sovereign, all-powerful creator, requires a creation, because, again, if, if Elohim is talking about being the creator, without a creation, the name would make no sense. Yahweh is the name which requires that there be a relationship with someone who is a lesser being than God, a needy being. So Yahweh is God's relationship name. His name which describes him as not only being relational, but as being in a relationship with creatures who are inferior to him, separate from him, and totally dependent upon him for everything. That would be us. Okay? Fourth, the name Yahweh is used to describe God as the covenant-keeping or promise-keeping God to those he has a relationship with. Fifth, Yahweh has the connotation of deliverance and salvation so that Yahweh is describing God as the promise-keeping God to those he has a relationship with so as to deliver them, save them, and keep them forever. Now, it's, it's, it's very important to understand that the name Yahweh only has significance to those people whom God has chosen to have a covenant and saving relationship with. This is their name for their God. And as it is used throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh is the name God uses to describe himself as the covenant redeemer of his chosen people. It's the name which emphasizes God's covenant promise to redeem, deliver, and save his chosen people. And whenever God's name Yahweh is combined with Elohim, it is emphasizing God as both creator God and redeemer God. And that's how it's used here. And and, and this raises a very interesting question. Why does God reveal himself through this name Yahweh which is emphasizing him as the Redeemer God, the God who saves, why does God reveal himself through this name in the part of the Genesis story where no one has even sinned yet? There's no need for a Savior yet. Why does he introduce himself as the God who saves in Genesis 2 when man doesn't fall until Genesis 3? I mean, it seems like the time to reveal himself as the God who redeems his people would be after there's a need for a redeemer. Not before. But that's not what God does. So so as he's relating to Adam and Eve, he is relating to them not only as their creator, but he is relating to them as their future redeemer. Now, I don't think they knew much about this. I, I don't think anything clicked. Here, in their minds. Adam and Eve are not aware of the fact that they are going to sin against God and need a Savior in Genesis chapter 2. But God is certainly aware of the fact that they are going to sin against Him in Genesis chapter 3. This is not a surprise to God. Genesis 3 Is not Satan dropping a bomb on God's plan and God now gets the 911 call from Gabriel in heaven and says, Hey, sin, what are we going to do about this, God? Oh, my heavens, I'm going to get down there right away and take care of things. That's not what happens here. There's no surprise. God is not phased by man's fall in Genesis chapter 3. In fact, it is part of the plan. The fall is not plan B. Redemption is not plan B. 
Now, God's aware of what's going on. He introduces himself into the story in Genesis chapter 2 on the best day on earth that there ever was. The best day, the greatest day that there ever was. The, the first full day, man and God are together, and, and there's no sin. Everything is perfect, and God introduces himself as, Elo, as Yahweh Elohim, your creator and, by the way, your savior. Best day. And when we look at the New Testament, who is identified as our Creator, Savior, God? It's Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. He is the Savior, He is the Redeemer, and He is the Creator. Now, we need to see that before Adam, who was our representative before God, before he sinned in the Garden of Eden, so as to cause all of us, everyone who has ever been born, to be born into a state of what we call total spiritual depravity, lostness, and condemnation as sinners who are hostile to God and who love sin over God and who because... They are spiritually dead, have no desire for God, and no ability to come to God so as to change who they are, so as to be saved. Before that ever happens in Genesis chapter 3, God reveals himself as Yahweh Elohim, the creator, savior, God, who will deliver and who will redeem his people. But here, here's the, the really interesting thing about what God does in Genesis 2.4. When he adds his name Yahweh to Elohim, he reverses the order. You would think that it would be Elohim Yahweh, the creator savior. Because in Genesis 1, he's the creator. That starts the whole thing, right? Maybe not. Maybe not. He reverses it and he goes Yahweh Elohim. The order is important. God's making a point here. He reverses the order of the names so that instead of it being Elohim Yahweh or Creator Savior, it is Yahweh Elohim or the Savior Creator. And it fits perfectly with the fact that Revelation 13.8 tells us that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. You say, well, I thought he was killed on the cross in like 33 A.D. You're right, he was. But in God's mind, it was accomplished before there ever was a creation. Before there ever was a need for salvation. Jesus, the Lamb, was crucified in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. I told you a couple of weeks ago that, that God is omniscient. He knows all things. He has always known that He was going to create. There's never a time where God learns anything new because if there were a time where God learned anything new, He could not be omniscient, which would mean He could not be God. Right? Right? So there has never been a time, if you are a believer, where God has not known you. Never. There's never been a time where God woke up one day and said, oh, by the way, oh, I, I, just, I just met this person. There's never been a time when he did not know that he was going to save you. There's never been a time when he did not have a plan to do that. There's never been a time when he did not know about Genesis 3. God does all things for His glory. And the great thing about that is that His pursuit of His glory intersects with the pursuit of our joy. And so He gets the glory, we get the joy. Now, in God's mind, Christ is the Savior before He is the Creator. That, 
You can get really wrapped around the axle on this stuff, can't you? You're going to go home and, and lunch will never taste the same. And all of this means that Adam's sin and the subsequent fall of man in Genesis 3 was not a surprise to God because he anticipates it in Genesis 2 and, in fact, anticipates it from all of eternity. And here in Genesis 2, he presents himself as Yahweh, the God who saves. So before there was sin, there was a Savior. Before there was, as some like to say, a covenant of works, there was a covenant of grace. It does not start with works. And let me ask you again, who is this Savior Creator God who the Old Testament calls Yahweh Elohim and who is introduced as such in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 who is walking with Adam and Eve in the garden? In John chapter 1 verse 23 Remember, John the Baptist is preaching, and the Pharisees and religious leaders come to him, and they say to him, who are you? And what they mean by that is not only who are you, but by what authority are you doing this? Preaching. And you're preaching about the Messiah that is coming. And John the Baptist says in John chapter 1, verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. Now, John didn't just make that up. That is a quote from Isaiah 40, verse 3. And look at Isaiah 40, verse 3. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 3. Let's get a little exercise here. Isaiah 40, you know, either in your Bible or on your electronic device. Whichever it is you use. Isaiah 40, verse 3. John the Baptist quotes this verse. And here's what the verse says. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord. Notice all the capitals in the wilderness. That's Yahweh. This is what John the Baptist is quoting. Rearranging it a little bit. Make it his own. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. That's Elohim. He's not referring to two different gods. He's not referring to God the Father or even God the the Son as two different beings here. Now, keep in mind, the doctrine of the Trinity. You have one God. Three persons make up the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are co-equal, co-eternal. Here he is attributing both of these names to one member of the Trinity, the Son. And what he is saying is this. He is talking about the fact that the one that John the Baptist came to pave the way for is none other than Yahweh and Elohim. He is the Savior, Redeemer, Creator, God. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh. In John 17, 6, Jesus is praying to his father and he says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. And the name that Jesus manifested is Yahweh, the God who saves his people. In other words, if you want to see and experience what and who Yahweh is like, who do you need to see? Jesus. Jesus is the one, John 1, 18, who explains Yahweh to us. And this is what Jesus said in John 14, verse 9 to Philip. He said to Philip, when Philip asks him, he says to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus' response to Philip was this, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Because Jesus is Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh, incarnate. Now we've looked at it before, but but look at it again. Go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. A great verse to use when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. Zechariah chapter 12, 
It is the burden of Yahweh. Verse 1, the burden of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. As you follow all of the personal pronouns down through Zechariah 12, it's all talking about Yahweh. You come to verse 10. I will pour out, this is Yahweh talking, out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now look at John 19, verse 37. John 19, verse 37. Jesus is on the cross. The religious leaders are concerned that the bodies be get taken off the cross in time for Passover. They come to the soldiers and they break their legs so that they will die because then they cannot rise on their feet and take in or actually exhale breath. They come to Jesus and he has already given up his spirit. He is already dead. Verse 34, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you also may believe. Verse 36, for these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And another scripture, Zechariah 12:10, which says they shall look on him whom they pierced. Yahweh. In Zechariah 12, Yahweh says, They will look on me whom they pierced. It is attributed to Jesus in John chapter 19, verse 37. Jesus is Yahweh incarnate, which is exactly why Jesus claimed 14 times in the New Testament to be I am. Remember what Yahweh said to Moses in Exodus 3, I am that I am, that is my name. Jesus claimed it. In fact, the name Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves. And that is why in Matthew 121, Gabriel, the angel, tells Joseph to call the babe Christ by the name Jesus, because he, Jesus, who is Jehovah, will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is Yahweh. He is Jehovah, the very God who walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they chose to live their lives independent of him, pursuing their own happiness in sin rather than in God himself. Don't blame them because we have done it a multiplicity of times since then. And remember that I said that from Genesis 2-4, the Bible presents only two kinds of people in the world. Those who know Yahweh and those who do not. Those who have embraced Yahweh and those who have not. Nothing has changed since then. There are still only two kinds of people in the world. Those who know and trust in Jesus, who is Yahweh, come in the flesh, and those who have not. Those who have eternal life and those who do not. Those who will go to heaven and those who will not. And so that begs the question, in which group are you? In which group are you? Do you have a personal saving relationship with the God who saves? It all depends upon whether you know and believe in Jesus, who is Yahweh come in the flesh. The God who went to the cross, paid for the sin of those sinners who will believe in him that they might be redeemed and have eternal life, which is knowing Yahweh. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word.
Thank you for introducing yourself so early in the Bible account as the God who saves. Thank you for doing it before we needed salvation. Seeing that this was part of this great plan to reveal yourself to us, not only for our salvation, but for our joy. Father, I pray that you will help us as we go out of here today not to forget what you have ordained and initiated and carried out through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, I pray that you would also help us who are believers to remember that when we sin against you, we are depersonalizing you. That is not a good thing. Help us to fight. Help us not to believe that sin will make us happier than you will. Help us not to fall into the trap of the world and our own sinful flesh and Satan and believe that somehow it is better to pursue and remain in a sinful lifestyle than to repent and turn to you and trust you. Father, there are, I would think, non-believers here today who need to come to you through Christ. I pray that they would. But Father, I think there are believers here today all of us struggle with sin. All of us are fighting a sinful, our sinful flesh. But Father, there are some who have quit fighting and have given into their sin and are in danger. Cause them to repent today. Bring them to the end of their selves. Don't let them continue to pursue that which is evil and wrong. Thank you, in Jesus' name.